Ben Muldrow is a community branding and marketing expert who has spent the last 18 years assisting communities develop identities that attract investors and encourage private and public organizations to commit to community development projects that lead to economic vitality, environmental stewardship, and social advancement. As a partner at Arnett Muldrow & Associates, Ben has designed, has designed creative branding and marketing systems in over 600 communities across 40 states and five countries, making him a true global leader in place branding and cementing his ability to combine strategic planning, brand development, interactive marketing, public relations, and social media capabilities to preserve and promote the power of place. And he's a very entertaining speaker, so you've made a good choice today on to come in this session. So, Ben. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> Sorry. How are y'all doing? I paid somebody on Fiverr to write that, um, some, that description, my bio. You could tell, like, after about $3.87, $3 it starts to get long and boring. Um, thank y'all for coming. Um, this is going to be fun, hopefully. I love to talk about this stuff. I particularly love to be here at Destination Downtown. Um, I have been doing this for a while. I've had the privilege of doing work in all three of our states that are represented here. This is some of the stuff we've done across the state of Louisiana. Uh, this is, let's see, why is it not showing me this? Stuff in Arkansas. Then are you ready for this? This is nuts, Jan. This is what we've done in the state of Mississippi. So um, obviously, whenever I come to hang out with you all, it, it is a little bit like coming to be home. And uh, so many friendly faces. I always try, look at Debbie, God. So many friendly faces, um, and Debbie. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that I want to do is I want to leave this super open. A lot of you have sat through this presentation before. I always try to change it up. I try to throw in the newest stuff that I've created so you can kind of see, like, what are some of the trends? What are we doing now? But please, at any point, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. Like, we, we're all friends here. Like, this is completely and totally good. Um, now, I didn't really say, I know Randy talked about it yesterday, but we also played a role in creating the whole brand around Starkville and Mississippi's college town. And it was one of the most fun times that we had. Um, doing a Mississippi Main Street resource team visit here to Starkville and coming to that realization that nobody had really owned this place in, in Mississippi. It was to a certain degree like when you talk to people, there was intense pride around Starkville and intense pride around Mississippi State. But there was also this little shadow of almost feeling lesser than. And I can say that as a South Carolina Gamecock. I understand what it is like to be in a state where maybe you're not always the best team that year in football. <laughs> so, you know, going through and being able to set something that the community could rally behind, and it was amazing to see. It was like the energy and the confidence was infectious, and it happened almost immediately. And like, I literally, I drove in this morning, and like a, a transit bus passes us, and it's like, they're using our brand typeface. Like, it's everywhere. And when you see that, you know you have created tools that connect together the pride of place, and you have given them the ability to weave this basket to hold together all the great things about their place. And that, that's what's so rewarding about this. So hopefully you will be entertained this morning. You might accidentally learn a thing or two, and, um, and we'll show you some examples of, of kind of what we're doing. But I always like to start with the question, why do we brand? I hate buzzwords. Um, if you have ever sat through a session with me, you know I will criticize words like sustainability and renewable and green and all of those things. So why do we brand? It's simple. And, and the example I always like to share is if you're making your kid a birthday cake or you're celebrating their birthday. Because I have five children. Believe it or not, my oldest is in college this year, which blows my freaking mind. But in the 1940s, we would have gone to that local grocer. We would have bought flour, eggs, sugar, spent about 50 cents, gone home and made a cake. By the 60s, we're going to go to that, that same local grocer, but 
But now we're gonna spend about $2 on a box mix. By the 80s, we're going to that chain strip grocery store where we're buying that quarter sheet cake with the scary plastic clown stuck in it. If you're a child of an 80s, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like the fuel of nightmares. And now in 2021, we're spending $500 in renting Fortnite trailers for our kids. And what this really shows us is it shows us this very, very interesting evolution of our economy in America. So kind of moving from that raw material economy into the product-based economy, then really focusing in on this service-based economy. And now we are literally like landed in the heart and soul of the experience economy. It allows every consumer the opportunity to spend their money in ways that give them experiences. You know, there is a reason why we are okay buying venti triple shot brown sugar oat milk shaken espressos for five dollars and 85 cents you know it's because for that 15 minutes worth of drinking that drink you're taking a vacation and that's what you're investing is in. it's the experience so um what does that mean for us I, I like to give you kind of this definition this is mine branding is the discovery preservation and presentation of a community's personality. Your community does not get branded. The brand already exists. It is your personality. So when you go through this process for yourself, what you're doing is defining the attributes that are important. You're figuring out what are those things that my citizens are really, really passionate about. This is not a theme, you know? It's, I always think back to working with Downtown Tupelo. It's like, what is one of the stories that everyone seems to know about Downtown Tupelo? Well, this is a place where Elvis Presley went into a hardware store and wanted to buy a gun. And his mom didn't want him to buy a gun. So he left with a guitar. Well, that's an interesting story. But the bigger story is the essence that everyone can connect with. You can go into our downtown and with a single transaction, you can change the world. That's powerful stuff, right? That's what we're trying to help discover and, and preserve and share. So one of the other things that we're trying to do is create brand equity. That equity is a big word for value. We want there to be value in your place. So I love this example. I realized I had need to update my car. But so you have this, this Mercedes SUV. How much does this car cost? Take a guess. 50, 60, okay? I, I always, 60 is like the go-to answer. And it's like when you see this car, you can picture, you can probably smell the leather seats. Like, and, and you can almost even picture what it's like when you pull up to that red light and that person next to you is like, <laughs> nice Mercedes, you all right? So $60,000. Well, what happens when you find out that this car is actually a Kia? Is it still worth $60,000? No, same car. It actually has leather seats, you know? But it doesn't carry the same value. Now, does that mean Mercedes is good and Kia is bad? No, it just means it's different but that personality carries with it value. What does that mean for our communities? What does it mean for our downtowns? Well, guess what? Brand equity is the answer to the parking problem. Most of you do not have a parking problem. You have a consumer motivation problem. You have lazy ass people <laughs> who like follow, that, follow that, that pathway for just a second, guys. So who's complaining about the parking? You're hearing it from the business owners most of the time, right? Where are they hearing it from? Their customers. Where's that transaction taking place? In their store. So the customer parked, walked to your store, and then complained about parking. The system worked, right? So what you come to realize is when your district has value, when your personality of place brings with it a certain experience of value and expectation, people are willing to park and walk. 
People are willing to take a risk to start a business. People, for the love of God, are willing to stay open past 5 p.m. All these things go into us helping to achieve our goals. So, I have realized that if you ever want to be an expert in the field, you have to come up with rules. So these are my five rules. Number one, the khaki rule. Say no to design by committee. It's horrible. So if we were to all sit here and have to design one and only one outfit that we would all wear collectively for the rest of our lives, we're going to end up in khaki pants. We're probably going to pick a single color polo shirt, and by accident, we're going to all look like we work at Best Buy. <laughs> because we were forced to try to compromise. Well, guess what? Do you really want your personality, your uniqueness, the passion that you feel for your place, that motivation that makes you go out and, and do and make your place great? Do you really want that to be revolving around compromise? Or do you want it to be bold? Do you want it to be able to, to maybe be a little edgy? Do you want it to help propel the community forward? So I got a great example. This is a, uh, a county that we worked with in Washington State, Kittitas County. It is just east of Snoqualmie Pass. So this is kind of the place where the gray and rain of Seattle stops and all the color comes back. So we come up with this really simple phrase, live life in color, Kittitas County. Tourism campaign, get people out of the metro, come spend the weekend, spend your dollars here. And then the committee got a hold of it. And what did they do? Well, we're a county. If you've ever worked with counties, you know how much fun that is, right? <laughs> county diplomacy. Um, nobody knows where we are, so maybe our logo should be a map. Because, you know, maps are really hard for us to find in 2021. So our logo should be a map. And then, hey, don't forget, we're a county, so we have to be fair. So, you know, maybe we need to list every single community in our logo because we want to be fair. Right? And it's just like with each iteration, it got dumber and dumber and dumber. And finally, someone from the committee was like, hey, I don't know if y'all realized it, but we actually made this suck. And they decided to go back, which was great. So just remember, you know, Randy Wilson used to always say that a camel is a horse designed by committee, and it is absolutely true. We know that these processes need input. The problem is we oftentimes put the input at the wrong time of the process. We start to create the strategy, create the design, create the messaging, and then we enter into the input. The input needs to come on the front end. So rule number two, for the love of God, say no to design contests, okay? There is a reason why MDOT does not do competitions to design the next interstate bridge, because it's just too important. You know, you don't need to be doing logo contests in your community for your downtown brand. Um, you want to see an example? Are you ready? Are you ready? Anybody want to see? God, it's like early. Y'all aren't excited at all. <laughs> Debbie wants to see. Okay, so this comes from India. Take it in. Take it in. Because if nothing else, they earn points for being thorough. <laughs> right? Like, they have figured out how to get a Russian-era rocket ship, a wind turbine, a jet that I don't know what it's doing exactly, Look at how happy the family is. Does anybody know what the name of this community is? It's really hard to find. It's the smallest thing in the entire logo, Kakanada. Wow. Welcome to Kakanada. Do what? The family is next to the rocket ship. Yeah, as a family should be, Susan, right next to the rocket ship. Um, so what happens in communities is we try to be cute. And then we end up with things like La Crosse, Kansas, the barbed wire capital of the world. <laughs> mm -mm. No. So this is not OK. And, and I, I want to tell you something very, very clear. And I'm probably going to contradict 
what some marketing professionals will tell you. But I, I am adamant about what I'm getting ready to say. In the world of community branding, many times consultants like myself like to create a challenge that I think is an impossible task. They say, for you to develop your brand, you have to identify the attribute that you have that no one else has. You need to figure out your competitive advantage. That's true if we're branding a corporation. This is a community. They're different. What is it that we want people to do? We want them to feel at home. We want them to feel connected to your place. We want the process of them going from an outsider to being a local to be as short as humanly possible. So do you do that by having a message that's alien? Or do you do that by creating a runway for hospitality and bring the money in, baby? Make it simple. Make them feel at home. And that is the way you create relationships. We overcomplicate this. We create the impossible task, and then the, re the response to the impossible task is the barbed wire capital of the world. Even worse than the barbed wire ca capital of the world is gas, Kansas. Don't pass gas, stop and enjoy it. <laughs> That's a fart joke. That's a fart joke as a community brand. Now, it gets worse than this, because then you go to Oklahoma, where you go to Hooker, Oklahoma, it's a location, not a vocation. <laughs> right, I see your face and I know where you're coming from, but guess what? This is not a joke because all of their sports teams are, sorry, hold on. Oh my God, this remote, it's horrible. Their sports teams are the horny toads. That ain't a coincidence. Their senior center sells once a hooker, always a hooker t-shirts. A lot of times people are like, well, you know, it's memorable. Yes, it's memorable. That's true. Is that where you want to be filed away in someone's mind? And then the final, and this one continues to blow my mind every single time I share it. This is Severance, Colorado, where the geese fly and the bulls cry. Exactly. <laughs> WTF, people, what does that mean, you know? So I had been working in Wyoming. I was in this general area. I was kind of like, oh, that's a reference to the beef slaughter industry, right? They must be like all the ranchers bring their cows there and they get slaughtered. No, no, the truth is even odder. Um, they are, God, this really stinks, y'all. I hate. Oh well, I'll tell you, it's the home of a place called Bruce's Bar. Bruce's Bar ser serves Rocky Mountain oysters. And if you've never had those, they're bull testicles. Literally, it is a reference to testicles on their welcome sign. So when you get into an argument over whether or not that shade of green is really good in the brand system that somebody is helping you to create, Think about the balls, people. Be worse. Now, rule number three, and I will say, over the 20 years of me working with communities, this has started to change. But when I first worked with the communities, all the community had was this seal. That was the only graphic tool. Now, I wish that this seal was a joke. This is an actual seal for Whitesboro, New York, Okay, they swear that this is a early settler and a native engaging in a fun game of Indian wrestling. Come on, right? Now, as you would imagine, in 2018, a resident said, hey, don't mean to start anything, but our seal might be perceived by some as offensive. So they did what every good community in America does and said, we'll take it to a vote. So of course the community voted to keep it just like it is, right? This is not a marketing tool, okay? A seal is not meant for a marketing tool. It's not, that's not its purpose. 
It's a formal declaration. It's an important tool to have in the world of a city government. It's a good representation of the actions of your elected officials. It is not the thing to market with. But I will show you there are some really bad ones out there. Um, we worked with Salisbury, Maryland. This was their seal. They win points for thoroughness. Um, they got pumpkins, tomatoes, haystack, cucumber, apple, strawberries, beans, sailboat, pine tree, college building, tree lined road, building lined street, all in their logo. Kind of like a garbage disposal, right? Like, Anything that might have ever been important to us, less included in the seal. Sumter, South Carolina had a iris, a swan, an opera house tower, and an F-16 fighter jet. Yes, you know, it's like throw it all in there. And honestly, that's okay. It really is okay. Now, they did get extra points because in the top right quadrant, those 11-story buildings that do not exist in their community, um, that's affectionately known as the Death Star Trench. So if you get a Star Wars reference in your community brand, you do get extra points. <laughs> now, from my home state of South Carolina, I'm here to share with you the worst seal in America. This is the obvious design by committee product. Six people got to sit around this table. Each one got to come up with their own word. So you have trust, honor, justice, industry, agriculture, recreation. Um, I mean, again, you win points for getting a tractor on it. Um, look at how industrious their industry is. Clip art Christmas trees. But I'm truly taken by the recreation opportunities here this so appealing. I'm not sure what that's a reference to because they don't have any water like that. Um, but the thing that I do think that we really need to acknowledge is, is the role of patriotism in St. Stephen. They, they are a proud and patriotic community, a, a community that has chosen to include the head and legs of an American eagle. <laughs> but they couldn't figure out where to bring the wings out. So. Um, you know, this is that perfect encapsulation of when you try to say everything, you oftentimes end up communicating nothing, okay? Rule four, the screwdriver rule, this is something that we learned from colleges and universities. And throwing a little SEC love here, one of the things that we take from colleges and universities is they have academic brands and athletic brands. Just like Mississippi State, Mississippi State has an academic brand mark, and then they have all of their athletic brand mark. So why do they do that? Well, if the football team is bad, they don't want it to affect admissions. You know, the merchandising revenue that comes in from athletics, like they need to be nimble. They need to be able to change quickly. While the academic brand, that logo that my daughter wears on her stuff today is the exact same logo that was at USC when I was there 25 years ago. So it creates a really, really nice system to be able to both preserve kind of the formal function while also giving that, that opportunity to connect with the consumer. Well, what does this mean? This is, this is really kind of looking at that difference between destinations and organizations. How many of you have heard the complaint in your community, why do we call it Main Street? Our Main Street's not called Main Street. Or why do we call it Main Street? Is that the only street you're interested in? We're more than just one street. They're all dumb arguments, let's be honest. But what we've done a bad job at from a movement standpoint is the brand equity around the organization brand. You should say we're a Main Street organization and everybody should understand what that is but we haven't gotten that awareness. So we need to be very, very clear about this is who we are and this is the place that we promote, okay? Why is that important? If your board does something that ticks off your business owners, you don't want them to abandon the effort of marketing the district just because they're mad at your organization. So being able to have those tools is really, really important. Rule number five, build the foundation, work the system, every day is a brand new day. Um, I, with this, I'm gonna give you an example of kind of a full system. Now, everything that you were gonna see was done on a resource team for Anniston, Alabama. 
So everything was created in three days, start to finish, okay? We started out with their organization brand. I always like to have a brand mark that maybe has four elements. I like to bring in four colors. So they had two reds, two blues, hitting in on the four point approach, um, creating this system that kind of helps them to understand, okay, that's our Main Street organization, but now we need to introduce this destination brand. Main Street is our group, downtown is our place. So it's a brand that feels like it connects, but it's also just different enough that they're separated. So then all of a sudden you start to look at all the different components of the brand mark and the, the brand system. Then you start to dig in and it's like, okay, so now we have the foundational components of this. Where do we go from here? Well, there they had districts and they needed help figuring out how to identify the different districts so people could truly understand how to digest this relatively large physical downtown. A lot of space, not a lot of people. So we created the Foundry District, the Boulevard District, and the Noble District. So then from there, we showed how it could make its way into things like brochures. Um, this is kind of a big thing with signage. You know, this is their downtown. So um, this is all their parking. Guess what they heard complaints about? <laughs> parking. So sometimes you just have to do this little exercise and be like, yeah, there's no parking. Uh, okay, um, so being able to tell that story, being able to, to help out with signage, fitting that into a full-blown wayfinding system, uh, banners for them, district banners. So again, you start to see the foundations get laid and then all the different pieces kind of get connected together. Vacancy treatments. Then we looked at the city itself, even though we weren't asked to, we did, because that's how we roll. Um, so we created a adaptation of what the city had been using, but brought in the colors and the typeface. Goodness. Um, this idea of the model city, that was something that they'd had for a very, very long time. So keeping that, but giving them the tools to tell that story. We brought in a whole different district of the community, West Anniston. West Anniston didn't know that they were a different part of Anniston. It was everybody in East Anniston that referred to West Anniston, so we had to figure out how to deal with that. That's always fun. Um, they had kind of branded their planning process, so we kind of rolled this whole thing around the idea of when you have a really robust planning department that likes to do plans, it's very easy for the citizens to be like, didn't we just do this? So we did a master plan, a strategic plan, a comprehensive plan. I'm confused, like those sound like the same thing. So they rolled all of their planning efforts underneath this, this umbrella of Planiston. Uh, we branded their, uh, their downtown business development process, which is called Pipeline, um, Wi-Fi downtown, and then we started to look at how do they communicate. So integration into Facebook, business cards, and then we even talked about things like creating media lists and all that kind of stuff. We, I will say, I think in the Main Street world, um, we are really, really good at coming to conferences and telling you, hey, I know that you have 84 hours worth of work to do in a 40 hour work week, so here's all the new stuff that I want you to do in addition to that, right? So I, I get, great pleasure in saying, hey, let's figure out how to do less. Because I think we do a lot of things that we probably don't need to. You know, social media, it can be daunting. I always tell this story because I think it's really, really impactful. Three years ago, um, my wife started an Instagram account to document the preservation of our house, okay? She's like, I just want to take pictures. I want to share what we're doing. She has 15,200 followers and she's posted 79 times. 79 times, three years, 15,000 followers, okay? It's not about posting every single day. People, believe it or not, have short attention spans, and our short attention spans are getting even shorter because of TikTok. So it, it is a real thing. People want good stuff, and honestly, they want good stuff and they really like funny stuff. We take ourselves too seriously sometimes. So being able to be funny, being able to have some humor, it goes a long, long way. Um, we looked at things like standardized press releases, making that job easier. Um, 
we actually created this idea. Has anybody ever uh, tried to organize a cooperative ad buy between your businesses, right? Is that not the worst thing to ever do? So instead of doing cooperative ad buys, it's like, hey, if you're trying to sell our businesses, we're gonna bring all our businesses together in one place, pitch them. What's your best offer, you know? And it changes that dialogue. This is kind of different these days, though, because it's kind of like, wait, you can buy an ad in a newspaper? What is that? So um, all those things kind of factor in. Develop strategic event schedules. Now, this is something that I preach about a lot. Our promotion committee, they're loud. They're all the extroverts. They all decide to be on the promotion committee, right? because they figured out that that's where you get to work on a beer tent. And then next thing you know, like promotion committee ends up kind of shaping the entire perception of what the Main Street organization and Main Street movement is about. And oftentimes what we do is we get good at putting on events, so we start doing more events. And before you know it, our events have lost any kind of strategic purpose. It's more of just kind of an ethereal, we're doing fun things and we're bringing people here to have fun. So really thinking about the strategy behind your events, why you do them, why you do them, when you do them, what the desired impact is. There is nothing more frustrating than going into a community and having them say, downtown's dead. And you're like, but y'all had a festival two weeks ago, it brought 14,000 people in. Yeah, but they're not my customer. What does that mean? People aren't your customer? Like, we do a St. Patty's Day pub crawl in our community. My community's 14,000. We have a very small downtown. We have an Irish gift shop in our downtown. Guess who doesn't open for the a pub crawl? <laughs> what the heck? I I, I, you're relevant one day a year. <laughs> one day that an Irish gift shop makes any sense. We are getting customers intoxicated in your district and you're not open to sell them things. I, I will never understand. So, you know, being able to have this strategic event calendar and then use it to prepare your businesses to be able to capture economic impact. We start doing some really cool meetings where it's merchandise planning meetings. So in June, people go to market and they start to pick merchandise for what's gonna run through their holiday season. So let's sit down with them and let's start making sure that they're adding things onto their order that they can sell during our fall festival. So thinking strategically goes a long way. Um, let's see. I'm gonna go fast, because I'm on slide 70 and I have 240. So I'm gonna jump through some of this. I will share this whole thing though, because it's just so engaging to read after the fact. Um, so I do, th I think that one of the big things that, that I love to talk about is this idea of creating downtown evangelists. And, being able to turn your own citizens into the people who amplify the story of your downtown. And, um, you know, celebrating your wins every single time you do a project, make sure that you own that as progress. We have allowed orange cones to be seen as inconvenience instead of a district moving forward. So own every interaction. Um, going through and being able to kind of create these slightly cheeky signs where it's just, you know, you, it's almost like having a dialogue. Nothing happens here. There were 2,000 people here on Friday night. You know, if you're thinking about starting a business in a downtown and you're walking the sidewalk and you walk past this sign, you're kind of like, huh? It's an interesting message and you're not used to seeing that kind of confidence. Products, making sure that your citizens have an opportunity to show their pride. I'm not dumb. I got this hat in Starkville, Mississippi eight years ago. It's gray. It's got a maroon state on it with a star in Starkville. I ain't no dummy. I know where I'm coming. I bought it here, 
You know, like, I did that because I like feeling like I'm connected to a place. I'm not from here. That, this place. This. Man, this is, it's a state with a star on it. You can all do that. Like, it's cool. Like, do this stuff. Most of the time, the merchandise from our community is ugly. Like, literally, the only shirt that I have for my community that I live in has 60 different logos on the back of it. It's freaking teal, people. Teal. I have a teal t-shirt. What do I do with that t-shirt? Cut the grass, <laughs> right? Paint, you know? Like, ooh, that's community pride. So give people things that they would actually wear out in public. Goes a long way. Um, Think about interactions that people have in your downtown, to-go bags, coffee cups, like all those things. These are great opportunities for branding. Brand co-oping, putting your brand alongside an established brand that already carries value with it. If your community that's trying to position yourself as an outdoor recreation base camp, make yourself six Patagonia vests. Are they expensive? Yes, they are expensive. You're doing it on purpose. You're transferring the premium value of the established brand onto your brand. Because guess what? People don't expect crappy places to have Patagonia vests. Right? Figure out what you're, you're good at and then go through and connect with that. I will never forget the first time my oldest daughter asked me for a swell bottle. I swear to God it would be like when a kid says, can I get a car? I didn't get it. It's like, what? it's a water bottle. It's a water bottle. Oh, it's a $45 water bottle with fairies that magically keep your beverages cold or hot. So again, this idea of brand co-oping, it goes a long way. Understanding what brands are popular and then getting yours connected to it. Merchandise, getting things that people want to wear. Okay, any questions? Y'all tracking with me? Okay, so again, all that, three days. Does not have to be hard. Create a system, test it, stress it, make sure that it works, make sure it's expandable, and then you start to grow legs. So our generally, general approach is when you think about your community, you think about the tools that you have, do you have the components of your toolbox? Do you have a defined color palette? Do you have uniform typefaces? Typefaces are fine. Do you know what font that is? Do you, can you use it? Is it installed on your computer? Consistent message, and then an approach to graphics. So I want to give you a kind of cool example. This is from a, a small district in Baltimore. And we started to look at it, and, and first of all, we started to explore where the immigrants that founded this neighborhood were from. So we had a, a wave from Germany, then Russia, then Lithuania, then Pan-African. So, with this, th this is kind of an interesting place. It is the home of the Star Spangled Banner House. It's the home of what's called the Shot Tower, which is at one time it was the tallest building in all of America. Um, it is right in the heart of, of downtown. So we wanted to create an icon that kind of started to stitch these things together. So again, we start with those base colors from our countries. We start with Star Spangled Banner. We have this kind of stylized flag. We bring in this inspiration from the Maryland flag, because if you're in Maryland, you have that flag tattooed on your body somewhere. Um, then the Baltimore flag, which is a derivation of Lord Baltimore's crest with the shot tower on it. So you start to see we're connecting the dots. And then, so you have this icon, very simple icon, connects with a lot of different things. But then what was really, really beautiful was this community has this unbelievable Jewish heritage. They're the home of the third oldest uh, synagogue in the country, the oldest continually operating synagogue. They have um, a whole row called Corned Beef Alley. Some of the oldest Jewish businesses in the country still exist. Jew the oldest Jewish deli that has been continually run by the same family exists there. So when we designed this, we wanted there to be a lot of symbolism. So all of those eight components to the side represent the eight landmarks that exist in the neighborhood. And we specifically designed the negative space to be able to hold the Star of David. So it connects in with that overall system. So again, we have the name Jonestown. 
if you're over probably, what, 45, um, you know that Jonestown is probably most known for uh, a city that's not here, that um, the phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid, comes from. So whenever your name shares a name with a mass genocide of a um, right-wing religious cult, you have to be really mindful. So, um, you know, we decided to really focus in on that Star Spangled Banner and on that kind of immigrant heritage of the American uh, success story. And, you know, what better way to do that than with the tagline, Proudly We Hail. And it just created that system that helped them to tell their story. So again, kind of showing how that works, um, telling some of those stories, talking about corned beef, talking about synagogue, you know, just telling all those different assets. And, and that's just a, it's just a really simple way to kind of create that system. Now, this is one of my favorites. I always share uh, Opelousas, Louisiana, one of my favorites. I don't think Melanie is here, but she, she typically hangs out with us. We worked there probably 15 years ago now. And um, the interesting thing about Opelousas, they're the home of Tony Satchery's seasoning. So if you've ever looked for Cajun Creole seasoning, you'll find that. Uh, they're the home of Savoy's Rue, largest maker of jarred rue in America. They're the birthplace of Zydeco Music, home of a man named Clifton Chinois who invented the rub board. Like, amazing stories, okay? And as we started to dig in, you know, one of the things that they told us was we came in, their, their logo was Opelousas with a Florida Lee next to it because, you know, Louisiana, everybody can be Florida Lee, right? And, um, and then it was like, well, what are you most proud of? We're the third oldest community in Louisiana. Third oldest. Woohoo! Uh, so it's kind of like, I mean, what you going to do with that? You know, it's like if there's a trend to start to visit the third oldest community in every state, you are on the money. Like, we're going to rock this, but that's not where we're at. So um, being able to figure out how do we tell this story, we love the connection to, to both Cajun Creole cultures. I learned in our work with the Chapalaya, I had no clue that there was a difference between Cajun and Creole. I thought that was like, just all oh, that's delicious is what I call it. Well, now I understand, you know, and being able to tell those stories, I think, goes a long way. Um, Opelousas is an interesting name. It's not the kind of name that you're used to seeing. You have to factor that in as you make your decisions. You know, if your community's name is Danville, then it's like people see that and they kind of get it. Like that's a standard naming nomenclature of how we kind of handle this. Opelousas, what does that mean? That factors into how we do this. So there are typically four different ways you look at it. Title style, down style, small caps, and all caps. And you really want to think about your name like a graphic. It's really important because you want that name to be consistent. You want it to be shown the same way as you go through this. So then from there, we started to look at different typefaces. And I made a decision that was a little out of the norm for me. I selected a typeface that was script and hard to read on purpose. My journalism teacher in high school always said, you have to know the rules before you break the rules. And typically, legibility is super, super important. When you know you have a place that's flying under the radar, when you know you have a place that has an intriguing story, when you know that you have a place that's fighting with a lot of other clutter, sometimes you want to stop people in the track by disorienting them. So they take the time to slow down and take it all in. So we landed on this with this great simple tagline, perfectly seasoned. Hits on our music, hits on our food, hits on our third oldest. We don't want to be the oldest. That's decrepit. We're the third oldest. <laughs> Perfect, right? So then from there, we started to look at creating an icon system, allowing them to talk about these three different storylines, the season sounds, season flavors, season culture. We even got the Florida Lee in there, right? So now you have this system that all kind of fits together, and we launched with community pride. It's great to be us. Man, people love it when you find a word inside your name, okay? So, you know, I mean, what? Art is in Starkville. So we can have a Raiders of the Lost Ark Festival, right? No, I'm just kidding. 
being able to, what, what this does is it slows people down enough to realize something they're familiar with has something that's hidden. That's what we're doing in our communities. We're trying to convince our own residents that we're worthy of rediscovery. We're worthy of the effort to go back in. So then from there, you know, we did all these input meetings and we always asked folks, you know, what color are you? What, if, if Opelousas was a color, what color would you be? And most of the time communities, I'll be honest, the, the answers are not particularly sophisticated. You know, it's like we're, we're blue and green because we have a sky and grass, you know, and a tree, we have a tree, so green, maybe two greens, because we have trees and grass, and, um, and in Opelousas, they were like, well, you know, we're not quite paprika, but we're, and it was like, what? What they were talking about was they were talking about the color of Tony's seasoning. So I went back to the grocery store, I bought a can of it, went to the hotel, poured it out on the little plastic tray in the bathroom, and took a picture. So literally what you're seeing is a picture of the texture of Tony Satchery's seasoning. And then that became the background for the billboards and the ads and the brochures, these little nuggets that allow people to tell stories about themselves. And I always love this story. This guy, he is absolutely amazing. His name was Joe Citizen. And he was like the conduit to the Zydeco culture. And if you've ever done planning work, we always talk about Joe Citizen as kind of the generic person. And he came up after one of our input meetings. He was like, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Joe Citizen. And I was like, it is so nice to finally meet you. You know? Um, but being able to tell those stories and, and connect those dots goes a long way. All right? Everybody still tracking? We got 20 minutes. I got, I only have 127 slides left. So we're going to go fast. All right. So I want to kind of walk you through systematically the way that we think about things. Okay, so to do this, I'm going to talk about Troutdale, Oregon. So step number one, look at what you have. Okay, analyze all the different ways that you're communicating. This is what they had. This was their current seal. It was inspired by a sculpture of two trouts <clears throat> making love. Ooh. Yes. So that's a good place to start, right? Feel the love. Um, so they also, they had this. This is what they had before it. So you can kind of see this weird, like, okay, we're going we're gonna to just kind of bounce around. But when we have Troutdale in our name, chances are we might need to have a trout. Um, and that's a hard thing to battle with, honestly. Because it's like, oh, well, this is easy. Troutdale logo, slap a trout on it. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. So looking at what everybody has, step two, make sense of the colors. Most of the time, we don't pay any attention to colors. Unless we're in a college town, and all of our colors are simply the university's colors, and then we don't think about it anymore. So deconstruct what you have. We went through, we looked at all the pre-existing logos they had. We created a color palette for them. We actually defined color bases for them. We created a destination brand palette for them. And then we even identified trout accents, colors that would very quickly tie in to these species of rainbow trout that exist in their river that we color sampled from. Because people who love birds, musical instruments, and fish are psychotic and they will call you on that stuff. I promise you. In Opelousas, I had the wrong accordion. Holy moly. There's a key accordion and a button accordion and Zydeco Music used one and Prairie Country uses a different and by God, you get it right, you know? And you learn that stuff. That's one of the things that's amazing, but those are the nuances that you pick up. Step three. Create consistency in your name. This is so very important. We spend so much time thinking about our logo, and we spend no time thinking about how we present the name of our place. So honestly, if you feel like your system in your community is not as good as it could be, simply adopting a word type and letting everybody's logo stay like it is could make a huge difference. So there, we identified typefaces. For the first time ever, well, first of all, we did a primary typeface. It's an all-capped sans serif typeface. Secondary was a very stylistic, what's called a slab serif. 
third is a really thick, meaty sans serif. And for the first time ever, we created an art time, uh, typeface. Every arts organization and event, we used the same typeface. Why did we do that? Because there were too many arts groups and artists can't get along. So we created visual continuity because there ain't nothing like trying to get arts people to design a logo, right? Am I right, Jan? You know, it's like there's a reason why the wall in a gallery is painted white. And we overthink the way that we do these things. So we created this to really stitch together these art efforts. So this is their word type. Step four, embrace the awkward or lean into the comfortable. So with them, we really started to tap in. We like to write a brand statement, a brand narrative. So um, I'm not going to read this for you, but we, we go through and we kind of talk about these, these concepts and these words shaped by nature, rooted, transported, connected, grounded. And then we get our trout, you know, because everybody loves that. So then you package the idea together. So, you know, when you introduce this whole thing and kind of bring it all together, it's like, okay, now, now I kind of understand the strategy of where we landed, where we landed. And once you kind of go component by component, once you give kind of the final product of how it comes together, it's kind of hard to argue it sometimes. Now, they might not love everything about it, but it's like once you start to see how all the system plays in, you start to see, okay, this kind of works for us. So, you know, we have this tagline, our nature will move you. We have what we call a moniker, Gateway to the Gorge. They're the entry point to the Columbia, Columbia River Gorge. That phrase is never going to go away. But many of our communities deal with these problems, okay? Write the word moniker down. A moniker is a great way for you to preserve a phrase that you don't like and open up space for a new tagline, okay? That phrase is all well and good except for eight communities say that they're a gateway to the Columbia River Gorge. So being able to say this statement will never change. We will always be gateway to the gorge. And we're going to start saying this. It's a great tactic. It's kind of a little diversion thing. We're preserving this and we're adding this. So, you know, giving them those tools, letting them see how it comes together, giving them the different versions, the one color, making sure the system works and expands, getting them excited about how the applications work. And then it starts to really cook when you expand the system. So we redid the city logo. We looked at all the city departments, created a color-based nomenclature for that system so that they could really go through and better communicate all the things that their city does. We even designed email signatures for them. This is their Main Street organization, Town Center Alliance. And then you start to connect the dots. So this was a giant redevelopment site if you see along the bottom, that's their downtown, okay? Then you see a massive railroad track. The railroad track is also divided by about 18 foot topographic change. Giant redevelopment site on the confluence of two rivers, right next to an outlet mall, okay? So this is a pivotal redevelopment site. This is probably one of the sexiest potential developments that could happen in the entire Seattle metro. And do you know what they referred to the site as? Anybody want to take a guess? Like that's sexy. Economic redevelopment site. <laughs> they got real, they're, they're like the ERS, the economic redevelopment site. It's like, okay, if you want a developer to step up to the plate and reach a vision, you need to help get them there. So what we did was we went through a process where we kind of thought about what do we want this to be, what, what do we want it to be connected with. We actually wrote a brand statement for this development site. 
the time is now, the opportunity is here, the vision is bold, our future comes together, the confluence at Traildale. So we simply set this stage for this is what we want this to be, you know? Um, talk to you about the arts, this is their fall festival, this is their uh, 10K run, first Friday art walk, cruise ends. Now, one of the important things about community branding is realizing that different events have different looks and feels. Has anybody ever seen t-shirts that are sold at cruise ends? They have 7,000 colors on them and the make of the car absolutely makes a difference. And if you had a Mopar car on it last year, you better, you better have a Chevy or a Ford this year or there will be hell to pay. You know, like you have to understand those audiences and you have to make sure that you're designing to fit in with that. So this whole series that we called Arts in Action with Art Trout, which was kind of a public art um, project, a public art master plan. If you haven't heard about this idea, this is one of my favorite things for our design committees to do. A public art master plan is a simple strategic process where you analyze your district and identify the appropriate locations in your district for public art to be introduced so that you can use an art as a catalyst to shape the way people act. If people complain about parking in a parking garage and walking through an alley to your main street, then art at that garage and art through that alley is strategic placement to help people do what you want them to do. This is not anything to do with what that art should be. It is a simple strategic location plan so that you can step to the table and say, these are the places that are important to invest in. So the idea of public art now serves an economic function, not just a fluff function. We do a real bad job of selling the impact of public art. We created a little trail called the Smelt Belt. They actually, um, believe it or not, they used to catch so many smelt in the river right next to Troutdale. All of the smelt feeder fish for SeaWorld San Diego we're coming from right next to Troutdale. So, you know, Shamu or whatever, Shamu 3, you know, was getting fed from Troutdale. Again, the premium products, the wayfinding signage. Um, in this particular community, because of how they are at the gateway to the gorge, they have massive wind that comes through, so we couldn't do traditional banners. So we had to actually do metal cut banners that came out of the posts so that they wouldn't get ripped off and fly away. So again, add templates, creating some of that messaging, creating some of that look and feel, telling that story. We actually created two different uh, ad campaigns to be able to help them kind of tell all that story and created a couple different looks and feels. So we had what we called the Cadence Series, our nature will move you, our sculpture will inspire you, our art will stir you and then our value series, rooted in history, shaped by water, connected through vision. So again, giving them all of those different stories. And then finally, one of the most important things in a really, really fitting way for us to kind of wrap up today is the idea of helping you know how to implement. So we've created a series of guides, everything from how to launch the brand, broken down into three phases, super easy checklist, literally on one page, you can see all of the components that are important to launching a brand. How to be a brand partner, this is for our organizations, event organizers, and businesses in our community, how they can utilize the brand to help grow brand equity. And then we've also created what we call brand score, so it'll allow your organization to go through and score their own brand and brand implementation. We've created this for main streets, for chambers, for city governments, and for individual businesses. More than happy to share all that with you guys. Um, so with that, I've got like, 10 minutes left. I'd love to take a quick break, ask any questions, and then if y'all don't have any, I'll show you a couple more examples. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Do we go back and freshen up? Okay, so that's a great question, Jan, and it's actually, it's kind of a segue into a couple more questions. How long should a brand last? 
I get asked that a lot. There's no fixed timeline. Um, sometimes a brand needs to exist in a transitional time period in the nature of your district. It needs to help you get from point A to point B. Um, so with that, you know, you might want to revisit it in three, five years and see where you are. Um, we had the privilege of working with Downtown Tupelo. We created a brand system for them based off some pre-existing components that they had. And then what was that, eight years later? Eight, nine years, does that seem about right? We revisited it with a very, very simple and kind of quick process and added some additional components. It was like we were able to look at how it had been used, look at what the strengths and weaknesses were, look at what, you know, it's like, what are the frustration points? Man, we need this, we'd love to have this, and add a couple components. Now, I've been doing this long enough that I have actually branded communities, like I've done systems more than one time for them. So the very first that I ever did, Lawrence, South Carolina, uh, was February 2002. And then we went and did a new process in 17. But it got 15 years out of it. So, you know, that's pretty good. So the big thing is, if you approach that four component system right of identifying your palettes, identifying your, your typefaces, it opens up the door for far more sensitive revisions instead of this tendency to dump everything and start fresh. So, you know, it might be that you need to just update the graphics or it might be that, hey, eight years later, we need a fresh tagline. We need a new message. We need a next round of communication. Great question. Anything else? Regional brand, great question. So we've done a lot of these. We've done everything from uh, multiple counties, national heritage areas, to we did a 19 county, 54 town and four city um, regional brand for Southwest Virginia. And the interesting thing about regional brand, anytime you go out of the size of a community itself, you open up a very, very interesting dynamic. When people develop brands, they like to develop what I call umbrella brands. They like to create a brand that kind of gathers everything under them and serves as that, I'm going to get you to gather by creating this umbrella to cover you up with. And our local players don't like that. They don't like to be covered up. So in doing regional brands, one of the things that I say is a good regional brand needs to have the opportunity to be an umbrella when appropriate and a platter when appropriate, offering up all of the entrees and sides of the communities that make that region up. And the ability for a regional brand to be subservient to its local attractions and local communities is the key to adoption. So, you know, when we did, we did the National Heritage, the Mississippi Gulf Coast National Heritage Area. And it's a beautiful, beautiful brand, but we also created very simple, small components that would make it easy for those communities to just kind of acknowledge, hey, we're here. So um, that is, I, I'll be honest, of all of the things that you have to brand, downtowns I like the most, cities next, large regions next, the ones that are the hardest are counties because a county has this weird, they're weird, you know, it's almost like by nature, most counties are governments run by people who hate government, so that creates a interesting dynamic. Then you also have the dynamic of county branding is often fueled by countywide lodging and hospitality tax. So you have a tourism office that is dictated to spend their money outside, so they're not interested in what other pe what local people think, but they are so interested in what local people think that the market, the product they bring to market is the county name, even though nobody knows what in the hell county it is, you know? And it's like, I mean, I feel like I deserve a prize because I can say Octibaha, you know? It's like, but like, where are you when you're a place? Most of the time you connect with that city. So um, counties are the hardest, but regional brands being able to create something when um, we first worked on the Arkansas Delta, you know, 14, 15 counties uh, along the, the eastern side of Arkansas. And the thing that was so beautiful about doing that brand was 
We then had communities after the fact, like when we worked in Blytheville, and they were like, we want to show, like we're proud to be part of the Delta. So we want to see if there's any way that we can have things that, that show that we're part of the Arkansas Delta. So that's one of the things that's really, really nice is being able to, to create that regional system that can be subservient to the communities it promotes. Does that make, is that good? Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. So ultimately, you know, I feel like communities are best served when they have multiple partners who are going through and doing the process together. That being said, that's, you don't have to do that. And um, you want me to be blunt or you want me to be diplomatic? It, it probably matters the least if it's the chamber. Because at the end of the day, chambers across America are somewhat in crisis. They're, with the growth of investment in economic development professionals, with the growth in funding mechanisms of lodging taxes, fueling CVBs, with the growth of the, the efficacy of Main Street organizations, the role of a commerce club as it used to exist in the 18 and early 1900s has diminished and many of our chambers have been left figuring out what their role is in their communities. Um, that being said, you know, you don't ever want to throw everything out and just say we're going to steamroll ahead, but understand the relationships that you need to have with the different folks and where it needs to come in. The city. City is probably the organization that would be most likely to do wayfinding signage. You want to have some level of cooperation with them in the hopes that they would at least be supportive of the brand that gets developed. It's not essential that everybody do the same thing. And, and honestly, sometimes it's scary because if you know what you need to do is focus in on downtown and focus in on Main Street, it's okay. That's okay for it to be just y'all. Is it, are you Blyville? Okay. Um, you know, in Blyville, I, I think that with the nature of how Blyville is, Blyville is a community that you have a lot of self-esteem issues that you deal with, with changing industry and with impact to the Air Force and with all these different things that go into who you are. And you have been through enough processes in the past. I think it is absolutely okay for Blyville Main Street and Blyville Downtown to do something on their own. That's completely fine with where you're at. Tell them I give you permission. Any other questions? Well, y'all, it is almost 11.15 on the dot. As always, thank you all so much. It really is. Um, being with y'all is like being with family. I love the energy that we create at Destination Downtown. I love the relationships that we have between Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi. I love coming here and seeing so many of you guys. Debbie, I'm thrilled to see you. I didn't know I was going to see you. I, you have got unbelievable shoes to fill, and I'm excited to see um, what you're going to do in Tupelo and excited for the entire Tupelo team. And um, But again, with all of you all, hopefully this is helpful to you. I will prepare a PDF of the full show, and then I also will put together a couple uh, PDF resources that I'd just like to share with some of the brand score stuff and that kind of thing. Um, if you have any questions, I always tell people I am really, really bad at email. I don't like it. When I open my email application, strangely, there are several hundred people that are asking me to do things. So I have found that as I have turned 40 plus, I don't open my email app as much because I, um, I know it's irresponsible, but hey, I'm getting to the point where I'm allowed to be irresponsible sometimes. So. Um, Feel free to uh, shoot me a text. I will make sure that my contact info is in there. Texting me is definitely the best way. Um, if you have questions, I'm always happy to, to address them. And, um, and it might take me a little while, but I promise I'll get to it. So thank you all so much for your attention. Thanks for all the great questions, and hopefully you enjoyed the show.